on my voice is audible deepak sir good morning students good morning to everyone sorry for the late students you can watch youtube and facebook also live is coming going on here please check it you can join there also then i'll or also has joined ali uh, once again i'll call the sir and uh, to start the session okay just take Hello, my should you can you hear me? Yeah, I can, sir. Sir, I can Hello, hear. Hello, my should you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Sir, your voice is audible. My voice is audible. Great. Yeah, your video is not visible. Yeah, just one second. Yeah, is it visible now? Yeah, it is visible. All right, fantastic. So let's get started. Uh, are we ready to start? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. You can. All right. So, uh, very good morning to all of you, and welcome back to online training uh, course and initiative by uh, Andhra Pradesh State Skill Development Corporation. And uh, would like to welcome you all on this Monday morning. Probably today is our last class, and then uh, tomorrow uh, the course is will be concluded. Uh, tomorrow you'll have a, uh, just an assessment, and then uh, it would be concluded. So. Uh, i mean today it will be concluded tomorrow we'll have the assessment so uh, in this entire course we have tried to cover um, almost everything uh, related to drug discovery and development starting from chemistry uh, i mean drug designing uh, computer aided drug designing qsr or even uh, talking about uh, different uh, screening tier uh, assays to be used early drug discovery preclinical drug discovery development exploratory studies and then uh, all the way to how a drug gets registered and then get uh, launched into the market and then uh, we have gone in deep dive into uh, especially preclinical where all the uh, discovery uh, screening models uh, for ADME uh, in vitro uh, studies uh, all the solubility uh, Octanol solubility, uh, simulated uh, gastric intestinal fluid stability, microsomal stability, permeability assays, and actual PK studies, toxicology studies. So these are all the things which we have covered so far, right? And then we also talked about uh, good laboratory practices and uh, its uh, implication uh, in drug discovery and development. So. Um, Today, especially, uh, we'll do a recap of uh, our animal uh, uh, part, uh, I mean, animal testing part. So how exactly, uh, which all animals are being used, we already covered, but we have done uh, revision also, I think. So now it's just the, this topic, I thought we should touch base one more time and then, then uh, we'll conclude our uh, class. So uh, we will have some 10, 15 minutes of discussion uh, from a career perspective and towards the end of this class where um, you know, with my whatever knowledge and uh, experience uh, I have, I'll, I'll try to answer uh, your queries if any okay so as I have promised uh, uh, let me just first uh, show you a virtual uh, tour a very quick virtual tour of a typical preclinical uh, animal research vessel uh, unit uh, so that uh, you, you can practically see how it uh, looks like. Okay. So, uh, Mayeshwari, you'll have to have.
once you are able to see the video clearly just tell me if it is uh, clearly visible or not okay okay sir uh, can you just, yeah it is clear can you can see all right so all right so let me just show you a virtual uh, you know, this thing uh, as you can see this is a preclinical uh, research unit typically uh, I, I mean of course uh, it is started from inside otherwise there should be a separate entry and as you can see once it is open you can hear some sound that sound is i'll take you back here and i'll, I'll stop in fact wherever required so this is a uh, air curtain so as soon as you open the gate the air curtain is on so that it will blow the air and then the what all dust particles in case uh, if it is there on your uh, cloths would be uh, taken away so uh, at the entrance uh, again i'm telling you this is not the main entrance the main entrance would be the outside where you will have a uh, uh, instead of curtain you can have a you know, air shower so you can pass through that after 30 seconds the gates open uh, gate gets open and then you come inside and then you are entering actually here so this uh, sound actually comes uh, as soon as you open the gate because the blower is on and then uh, you see this is the basically uh, the change room so all kind of uh, protective wears uh, should be there in the change room uh, including your wrap runs uh, your uh, pp uh, if in case uh, if you if you are using, uh, using pp is all different kinds of pp is are there class a b c uh, based on what micron that material is made up of so you can use pp a b c and then uh, uh, this is the uh, face mask, uh, your disposable aprons, your actual aprons, uh, shoe cover, uh, head mask, and gloves. A crossover bench is must so that uh, you always remember to gown up uh, in all the PPEs and everything, and then only you enter in. And uh, just uh, one second, give me a moment. Uh, Yeah, Mahishwari, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Your PPE yeah. has gone. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay, so we will we'll just uh, pick up from there where we ended. Uh, this was the one. Uh, we are here. I have to make it on. Okay, so uh, we are just entered inside. Uh, just a quick recap. Uh, there would be an air curtain. Hello? Sir, your PPE is not visible. It's not visible? Okay, one second. I'll go back here. Please share your screen. Hash stopped sharing. Is it visible now? Yeah, now it is okay. <clears throat> now it is okay, sir. You can continue. Yeah. So once you enter in, uh, as we were discussing, there will be a protective wear. So in the change room, all those things should be available with you, including shoe cover, mask, um, you know, goggles, gloves, everything. A crossover bench is must, a login entry and a shoe uh, cover dispenser. So if you don't use a manual shoe cover, you can use a shoe cover dispenser and down up and then you have to enter inside. And um, this is a single corridor um, animal facility. So uh, on the top, you can see uh, these are HEPA filters through that uh, the exhaust and inlet of the air is maintained. Uh, as I have mentioned earlier, in animal house, uh, generally, uh, it should be class 1 lakh. So whatever air uh, enters in the animal house should be, uh, should be 0.5 micron filtered and whatever is going out should be also filtered. Uh, this is a breeding room. Uh, again, I'll stop here. So you can see this is a typical stainless steel uh, uh, 
uh, holding uh, stand actually uh, for uh, your uh, what do you call uh, for the cages so these are polypropylene cages as you can see if you can see my cursor with a water bottle and uh, a stainless steel grill and uh, this is basically a rat cage so typically around three to five uh, rats can be easily kept in here so with a water bottle and there is a space where you can put the feed for them and these racks are movable so that you can always move based on your requirement the blue uh, flooring which you are seeing is epoxy flooring with a coving so that it's very easily uh, cleaned and uh, typically you just have to uh, clean the dust particles everything from here and then uh, there won't be any deposition of the dust particles so it's easy to clean okay so this is a typical uh, stainless steel a cage holder and with uh, different cages okay let's move further uh, if you see uh, based on the room size you can keep how many animals you want to keep this is a quarantine room so in a quarantine room let me stop here this cage particular which you are seeing is a rabbit cage okay so stainless steel cage holder and a cage where you can keep one rabbit uh, individually caged uh, if required otherwise a couple of rabbits can be kept so these are bigger ones with a water bottle and an area where you can put the feed for them okay uh, this is just to showcase this but uh, typically uh, i just wanted to showcase that this is a quarantine room so whenever animal enters in the facility for the first time if they are not in house animals then you have to keep them for uh, quarantine period so you want them to acclimatize for uh, for the environment conditions so keep them for at least a week seven days uh, acclimatization do the health uh, checkup and once they are uh, given a certificate of being healthy uh, no bacterial viral infection uh, then typically you can transfer them inside the animal facility so that's a role of quarantine room okay let's move further uh, this is uh, typically you can see a test room so after uh, when your experiment starts you can keep your animal in the test room uh, this is an uh, uh, one second i i should show you this uh, this typically the one which you're seeing this is called an observation window okay so a glass window uh, typically uh, it is um, with a glass shade from inside out uh, from outside you can see inside from inside they are darker so that uh, there is no disturbance of the light but the advantage of having this windows in animal facility uh, animal room is that you without disturbing the animals you can observe them from outside as and when required you can simply observe the uh, inside conditions you don't really have to uh, enter inside if there is no work related to that because that would be an unnecessary disturbance to those animals okay so like that they can be uh, test rooms different test rooms this is another test room where again you see smaller cages so this uh, once again let me go back here so this uh, particular key uh, is uh, uh, is mice cages so typically uh, i mean they are also pretty much same as rat cages but size is smaller okay so you can have test rooms separate test rooms so, so please remember each species should be kept in different rooms try and not mix up the different uh, species and uh, also try and not mix up the different strains because if physically you're not able to differentiate you may really get confused so it's better and even cross contamination can also happen so try to keep only one kind of species and strain in a particular room now this is a, a procedure room uh, as you can see so any procedures needs to be carried out then you can bring your uh, animals uh, cages or racks in this room and you can do surgical intervention anesthetic procedures dosing procedures formulation mixing procedures all those things can be easily done in this room so you should have a separate procedure room and then movable trolleys should be there so that uh, uh, you can use those things for uh, purpose of uh, taking the material from one place to the other so uh, there should be movable trolleys and uh, then a separate with a separate partition you should have a wash area and the necropsy area so the idea here in this particular design is that uh, since this particular lobby uh, is uh, separated with this door here uh, so wash areas and the necropsy area which are considered to be more dirtier are separated from the main uh, rooms so uh, whenever you design uh, this is a, just a very basic uh, single door single corridor animal facility virtual tour i'm trying to showcase to you but 
uh, when you have uh, space uh, availability please maintain uh, same thing like uh, your wash areas your necropsy areas sh should be towards the end of your facility and uh, somehow there should be a barrier you can so that you can really uh, differentiate the different areas in terms of contamination even when the cleaning is happening you should clean this in a way that uh, start from cleanest area and then go to the dirtiest area so that after that uh, there is no contamination okay so let me show you this now so this is a lobby typically it should be wide enough where you can really uh, move your racks move your cages everything easily okay so this was uh, a virtual tour uh, in in terms of how an animal facility look this is br room means a breeding facility so if you are doing in-house breeding you can always have this so now uh, i'll just play this one more time so that from starting onwards you can have a look i was just uh, in between explaining so i had to stop the video but let me play from starting so now you can really uh, follow the whole uh, sequence okay from the entrance you enter inside the facility before entering you can actually have an air curtain uh, at right at the entrance the moment your door uh, open the door it gets open then there will be a head mask face mask uh, shoe cover aprons disposable aprons uh, all, all wear all the protective uh, wear uh, including gloves uh, and then, uh, then it, you have to go through pass through the crossover bench if required use the in-house shoes or use a shoe cover and then you enter inside the facility and you will have different rooms like quarantine room test rooms breeding facility this is the light intensity led lights around 350 uh, lux meter uh, br1 br2 is nothing but breeding room there you can do individual um, uh, species breeding so typically this is a stainless steel rack conventional uh, facility it is a conventional caging system with pro polypropylene cages and the quarantine room where animals when the first time arrive in your facility they can be kept there for getting acclimatized minimum for seven days once they are acclimatized they can be utilized for experiment for experiment you have to keep them in a separate room called as test room this is an observation window through which you can observe the animals uh, if you don't uh, need to disturb the animals you can simply observe them from the observation window you any procedures starting from dosing blood collection everything should happen in a separate room called as procedure room and in that room typically you can do uh, anesthesia surgical interventions blood collection dosing formulation preparation all this thing can happen here and uh, uh, as you can see it's a class one leg facility so uh, there is uh, air which is entering inside is through 0.5 micron and which is coming out is also filtered through 0.5 micron you should have a barrier uh, i mean uh, physical partition from necropsy area or your wash area and uh, cleaning procedures also always start from cleanest area go to the uh, most dirty area last so that uh, contamination uh, cannot pass through uh, from contamin from a dirty area to a clean area so typically this is how uh, animal facility looks like an epoxy flooring uh, uh, you can have the false ceiling whatever false ceiling you want to have but always have inlet outlet through hvac system rather than having a fan or uh, split ac uh, it is always advisable to have a centralized hvac system in place okay so this is typical uh, animal facility uh, which uh, as you would have seen by now that even uh, a normal uh, university or a college or a small CRO can really have this in place okay so with that uh, let me now take you back to the presentation I will just share my screen just give me a moment Okay, Mayeshwari, are you able to see my screen now? No, sir. Your screen is not. Yeah, now okay. Okay. All right. 
so uh, let's get started with this uh, uh, so uh, today just one topic we will try to do the the revision for because i think rest all the things we would have already covered um, in all in the last few classes so typically we have seen an animal facility a cpcc approved uh, facility i mean it was most basic thing you can have a double corridor design from uh, the entrance door for each room would be a separate and there will be an exit room so that once you enter in you just go from exit room into the dirty corridor and a clean corridor is where you uh, enter and uh, enter in any of the rooms so the uh, dual corridor animal house designs are more widely accepted than the single corridor but if there is a space constraint it is a smaller facility you can always have this why i have shown you this is because uh, see it is it is very easy to comply with cpcsa guidelines okay but sometimes uh, we we just tend to uh, at colleges i have seen many colleges i have been a uh, cpcsa uh, i mean i have been a trainer and a nominee for that also so i have seen uh, people don't really they just feel that it's too costly affair but i just want to clarify that to maintain an animal laboratory animal facility is not that costly affair with bare minimal investment also you can really make good standard uh, facility so please um, uh, please try and see that uh, your test system and uh, test item uh, i mean you get tested uh, in test system right so animal facility is a system so if you have good uh, facility in place you maintain your animals properly then the data which we generate out of that is also more authentic reliable reproducible that's why you should have uh, a cpcsa approved facility and uh, as per the cpcsa standards only okay so uh, in laboratory animals uh, we have covered this topic almost uh, eight nine days ago so why we use laboratory animals which species are used where to use uh, how to how do we maintain this and how the animal experiments are regulated few things we we just um, will uh, have a quick recap so one of the thing was why we use animals so because it's a suitable alternative to human systems uh, in terms of organ system metabolism enzyme system expressions of different metabolic enzymes they are pretty much same as it is in human okay and whatever data you get from animals can be extrapolated to higher species to human that's why we can we should use uh, animals for research and why uh, without animal i mean people uh, usually complain that uh, it's not fair and it's, it's not ethical to use animals but uh, this is just to showcase that uh, dreadful diseases including cancer and many other diseases if you want treatment uh, if you want any uh, vaccines uh, to be discovered then animal research is must okay so of course we are higher species and we have advantage over, over lower species but uh, as i have mentioned and discussed earlier of course we should not do indiscriminate usage of animals but wherever possible we should definitely uh, reduce the number of animals to be used in research but completely not using animals in a research uh, in a drug research is not a uh, not an option at all just few data on why uh, animal research is very important most common species which are used in uh, drug discovery development are rats mice and other rodents right so mouse is also called as mus musculus or lice can itself is hardly 2 to 1/2 years the birth weight is hardly 1 gram very timid gentle easy to handle species okay and uh, they they completely starts uh, after birth uh, by 13th or 14th day they will start eating the food also uh, they are maintaining propylene cages i have shown you the propylene cages how they look like uh, and then temperature again 23 plus or minus 2 degrees relative humidity of 30 to 70 degree 70 percent uh, light and dark hours of 12 hours and uh, you should have a control over the uh, noise not more than 80 uh, dbs should be the noise level and uh, nutrition uh, like palleted feed is always available for these animals where they are used we have seen in entire drug discovery development especially for pharmacology toxicology for genetic toxicology studies for diagnostic purposes and for behavioral studies rats called as raptus novelgicus uh, the scientific name 
the most popular strains are Vister and Sprat Dolly Reds. They both look whitish in color. And again, they're kept in uh, cages, uh, profiling cages, as we have seen in the video. And again, they are very uh, easy and beautiful animals to handle. Total lifespan is around three years. And after birth, by 16th day, they they are they are independent in terms of they they are able to eat their food. Uh, breeding maturity is around seven weeks. Uh, their environmental conditions are exactly same as that for mouse and uh, they are coprophagous so you should not overcrowd them should not keep them for fasting for longer hours otherwise they can eat each other and they are also used in all the different phases of drug discovery and development guinea pig avia porcellus uh, again they are very active in day and night amniable gregarious uh, they are uh, their weight, uh, they are a little bulky, uh, as you can see from the picture here. Uh, around 400 grams a male will weigh, and uh, females are even more bulkier. This may be a female uh, with 650 grams uh, minimal weight. Okay, and uh, temperature conditions uh, around 18 to 26. Uh, I, temperature and environmental conditions are typically the same across okay palleted feed material is uh, feed is given to them their diet should be comprised in such a way that you have 10 to 15 percent of fiber you have 18 to 20 percent of protein and vitamin c supplement okay uses uh, diagnosis uh, tb anthrax and leptospirosis and for vitamin c uh, studies also they are used higher species like cattle and swine uh, they they suffer from smallpox Organ transplants, uh, uh, I mean, they can be used in diabetic research and uh, arthritis, osteoporosis. So there are so many areas. Another well-known, well-accepted, highly studied species in preclinical is rabbits. For all ophthalmological studies, for vaccines, for antibody productions, for acquired immunity research, cholesterol studies, all these studies are done in rabbits. Uh, the most uh, okay, they are uh, they are called as Oryctolagus uh, cuniculus. Their their scientific name. Most common strains are New Zealand white and Soviet chinchilla, and um, uh, the breeding age is like around four and a half months for a female, and male takes around six months uh, to become to be able to mate. Okay, and um, their uh, uh, feed should typically have fiber, protein, and uh, concentrations of around 12 percent and protein varies if it is a maintenance diet then it can be less and if it is for the growing uh, purpose growth purpose then it can be more so the environmental conditions are um, typically same as it is in other animals except for the light hours they need more around 14 hours minimum okay and uh, usage again they are used in different areas we have talked about and um, they, are, they are also used in hypertension. They're a very good model for virology, embryology, serology, and other uh, drug testing. Uh, one of the higher species is dogs, which is also used for, test, uh, for testing of uh, drugs, eventually which gets into human. So the species used is beagle dogs, okay? The down diagram is from a beagle dog. Uh, for frogs, fishes, lower uh, species also are used. Uh, zebra fish is one of the most common species used very early in uh, drug discovery. Okay, so uh, that's about uh, the different kind of animals going slightly higher non-human primates. So for polio, rubella, hepatitis, uh, Parkinson's, AIDS research, measles research, chimps uh, as uh, they are very close uh, anatomically to human, uh, so we consider uh, primate also as one of the uh, model for drug discovery and development. So, in nutshell, uh, you use hamsters for virology, cancer, dentistry, cytological investigations, gerbils are used for bacteriology, virology, bats, uh, not that common in India, but in China and all, they are used uh, for ecolocation, thermoregulation, uh, and all. Uh, dogs, of course, is used for toxicology and pharmacology, beagle dogs, cats, again, is as a pet, but they can still be considered uh, for a few uh, special census studies and all, cats are also used, right? Same way primates, um, in even human, uh, as you know, that eventually for the human drug discovery development, the target species is human. So final clinical trial almost every time happens in Homo sapiens, which is human. 
uh, advantages of lab animals so uh, is, is uh, we already talked about it small in size they can be maintained in a controlled environmental conditions we can ensure a genetic purity and uh, controlled breeding can happen and easy to handle so those are the advantages and uh, they are used everywhere in drug discovery ADME potency testing safety acute toxicity or any other chronic toxicity studies so environmental toxicity studies eco toxicity studies aquatic toxicity studies everywhere these animals are used indiscriminately uh, so veterinary drug approval process is also more or less same as we have uh, human drug uh, approval process you need to have proof of concept you need to have in vitro assays in vivo assays safety studies and then finally you go for registration there additionally there is a there is one more additional thing to be studied for veterinary drugs that is human food safety and environmental safety impact because uh, finally some in one or the other form drug would be uh, released into the environment so that needs to be tested uh, and uh, few animals are used for for uh, for feeding purpose for i mean as a food so their safety has to be ensured uh, in terms of uh, what is a food uh, human food safety uh, potential okay so there is additional rest all the things are pretty much same as it is for human drug discovery and development and uh, as i already mentioned we talk of ethics but yes uh, you can definitely stop using indiscriminately animals into research but uh, you have to use animals that's for sure okay at least you can make sure that animals are properly maintained as the animal facility we have just visited so at least it should be as per the cpcse guidelines and try and make sure that animals are uh, pretty comfortable in the environment uh, which we are providing them so cpcse is a regulatory uh, body which uh, covers the experimentation of animals so it's committee for purpose of uh, prevention of cruelty and supervision of experiments on animals so CPCSCA, okay, that is the full form of that. It comes under Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And uh, as per the guidelines of CPCSCA, each and every institute, lab, college, or uh, research institute, if they want to do any experimentations on animal and they want to have an animal facility, then it should be registered with CPCSCA. And each institute should have their own institutional animal ethics committee, which is called as IAEC. Uh, typically, there should be an eight member. It's an eight member committee, which is headed by the uh, head of the institution who will be the chairman. There, there should be two biological scientists as a part of this committee. One scientist should be from outside the uh, institute. So just to bring in an unbiased scientific op uh, opinion suggestions uh, onto the committee and uh, laboratory animal house in charge should be a part of it uh, you should be having a one veterinarian uh, who is responsible for the for the management of the animal facility and then uh, there should be a cpcac nominee so cpcac will nominate a couple of members who will be the cpcac nominees in absence of a cpcac nominee uh, there should be a link nominee who can conduct the meetings and then finally there should be one person on this committee again appointed by cpcsa should be the uh, socially aware person so this person is not a scientific person but is socially aware person who will practically uh, be responsible for bringing in the animal welfare opinions onto this committee so that's uh, the formation of IAC. So each and every protocol, uh, if you want to use animals for your research, for your dissertation work, for your PhD research, or for any drug testing or screening or toxicity studies, or a pharmacology studies or a PK studies, you have to prepare a protocol, fill up the details in a form called as form B, which is available on CPCC uh, website. So this form has to be filled out and you have to call for an IAC meeting and you have to present this form to this committee members. They can ask you a question, either technical or from an ethics or a welfare point of view. And if they are convinced, they will approve your protocol. If they are not convinced, they may ask you a few further clarification or may ask you to modify the protocol. And finally, once they approve, then you are, uh, you are allowed to use the animals for research purpose. So that's the role of an IAC. If it is for laboratory animals, IAC of each institute have this right to take a decision uh, to approve or disapprove a protocol. If your animal uh, 
uh, if your uh, protocol uh, involves usage of higher species of animal be it monkey chimps or dog uh, then you have to review the iac will review the protocol and then they'll forward it to committee for large animal uh, committee uh, in as a under cpcsc in new delhi so then your uh, protocol would be approved or rejected uh, from the central committee there so for laboratory animals uh, institutional animal ethics committee can very well approve or disapprove the protocol but for larger animals it has to go to to new delhi to cpcsc committee for large animal research so what's the role of cpcsc to form a guideline for animal housing management breeding for uh, constructing and to do animal experimentation and the welfare guidelines so this is what is the ro role of cpcsc another important role is they are the only sole national level regulatory agency who has a power to approve or disapprove animal house okay they scrutinize each and every research program to approve the animal use and they minimize and rationalize the animal usage in experiments there is a concept of three as i mentioned it is four hours so you wherever possible you can replace the usage of animal that is by alternate techniques definitely right by using cell based models uh, and then somewhere uh, you can reduce if possible instead of using more number of animals if you can get required information uh, and statistically significant data from less number of animals please go for that refine always make sure that uh, wherever possible make your interventions painless okay so the procedure should be painless and as long as possible try and minimize the stress to animals okay by enrichment and other means and ways and by feeding them well by providing them them continuous water supply and everything and keeping them disease free uh, so you can really refine and wherever possible after experimentation uh if you don't have to sacrifice them please uh, uh, keep them for washing period where washing period means uh, suppose you are given a, any particular drug to the animal uh, look out for the half life and when such 10 or 15 half lives are over then you can reuse the same animals because by 10 uh, 7 minimum 7 half life is more than sufficient uh more than 99% of the drug would have come out of the body so now animals can be utilized for any other drug testing so try and you reuse the animal wherever possible so that is redundancy so replace reduce refine and redundancy should be followed uh, as four r concept of cpcsc in terms of management of animal house we want good quality animals right so good quality means they should be healthy as i said for the first time when animal comes into the uh, facility uh, just keep them in a quarantine room so that's an acclimatization period uh, closely wash them give them sufficient feed and water and uh, take some blood samples and look for some bacterial or virological uh, infections if possible if they are clean they are healthy after 7 days they can be moved inside the animal facility in other rooms and they can be utilized for doing any experimentation so as per cpcsc a minimum 7 days of acclimatization is must when animals arrive uh, in your facility for the first time from outside if you are doing in house breeding then you may not need this much of uh, acclimatization maybe 2 to 3 days acclimatization should be more than sufficient we want these animals to be free from hunger so feed them well stress give them good space uh, social environment pain wherever possible use analgesics thirst so ample amount of water supply and they should be disease free so this is how you can make them free from hunger stress pain, pain thirst and disease in terms of environment we have talked about uh, environment should be in controlled conditions which is typically temperature of 23 plus or minus 2 degrees relative humidity of 30 to 70% light should be around uh, 350 lux and uh, noise not more than 80 uh, dbs noise and air exchange around 15 to 20 air exchange per hour so this is a typical environmental conditions required in any animal house across country as per the guidelines of cpcsc housing type maybe what we have seen was a 
conventional in, in a sense it was a it was a barrier facility uh, do you have specialized cages and procedures and all uh, but uh, larger species can be kept just in a conventional way you can have a stainless steel cages uh, racks and you can keep polypropylene cages and uh, with water and feed uh, provisions for that and you can use uh, hvac system with the filters for the air so this is how a barrier house works aging systems typically you can you should have uh, there is a provision to have individually ventilated cages so each cage will have its own controlled environmental conditions so even that is possible if you have ivc cages uh, what we have shown in the video were not uh, they were poorly propylene but they are not transparent but nowadays even transparent cages are available so from outside you can observe the animals also okay a bedding material the most important uh, aspect of animals environment is bedding material so it can be paddy husk corn cob paper shreddings wood uh, shavings or uh, it can be husk so whatever bedding material you use please make sure that it is sterile it should be absorbent so that whatever urination or fecal thing comes out of it it gets absorbed through it and then you have to keep changing it every alternate day or at least twice a week bedding material should be changed in a typical animal facility and equipment sanitization please make sure i shown you in the video an epoxy flooring with a coving so that cleaning is very easy uh, if there are any perpendicular corners there is a possibility that some dust particle can settle down there so to avoid that please use uh, coving and epoxy flooring so it's easy to clean okay and at least have twice disinfection to be done as i mentioned start from cleanest room go to the dirtiest room at the last so that uh, inter room uh, contamination can be avoided as long as possible each room should have separate uh, mopping uh, material uh, mopping rod and, uh, and a bucket and a separate uh, cleaning uh, procedures so that uh, you don't uh, spread contamination from one room to the other room so those are few basic things you can uh, keep in mind while doing sanitization in animal facility we have discussed about environmental enrichment uh, wherever possible please please provide uh, provide ample enrichment in order to reduce the stress like tunnels uh, like stairs these are few basic things which can be provided where animal laboratory animal feels more relaxed or more natural uh, behavior they are at and uh, activity if possible like exercise exploration social interaction so always keep them in groups of 2 to 3 bare minimum so that they can socialize okay uh, health monitoring uh, as i already mentioned while they are in acclimatization or even in your in house facility wherever possible try to do the health monitoring for viral bacterial fungal or any parasitical parasite infestation there are diagnostic techniques available you have elisa pcr IFT cell cultures can be done to check this thing. Okay, and precautions for a person uh, while working in the animal facility, uh, as you can understand, like not only laboratory animals, any animals can spread disease back to human if they are zoonotic. So uh, if you are immunosuppressed, if your immunity is less, please be careful while handling the animals. If you are allergic, allergic individual should also make sure that uh, take proper care because. Uh, from their fur uh, and the, from the dust uh, coming out of the bedding material can really cause some allergic reactions into the person who is handling the animals so uh, and uh, as i mentioned very clearly in the change room uh, be it face mask head mask gloves uh, goggles uh, apron disposable aprons or cloth uh, cotton aprons shoe cover all those things are must while you work in an animal facility and since they have very sharp incisors please please prevent yourself from getting injured also whenever wherever required so what you have to do is uh, uh, two things one is before you start working on animals get your tetanus uh, injection done vaccination and hepatitis b this two vaccination at least we always recommend uh, to have okay common allergens as i mentioned can come from their fur urine or serum proteins right tissues saliva dander uh, so routes of exposure should be could be bedding material direct handling of the animal dumping of the litter material or while you are collecting the samples 
and these are few disorders uh, which are uh, I mentioned the symptoms like contact urtic area if you have any redness or itchiness of the skin uh, it could be contact urtic area if there is any eye in, uh, clear, not uh, clear discharge and uh, conjunctival vascular engorgement that have happened means you can have allergic conjunctivitis allergic rhinitis much uh, related to sneezing and itchiness asthma again wheezing cough anaphylaxis itching throat tightness hoarseness all these things will really prove uh, and will showcase the disorder which you would have obtained from working on animal facility or handling the animals so the only way is use proper preventive measures in terms of pro uh, personal protective wear as well as vaccination uh, just few incidences uh, and uh, even whatever sharp uh, like using syringe needle or scalpel you must be using an animal facility is a biological waste uh, so please proper disposal should be planned if your facility is having an in-house incineration facility within the premises you should definitely do a very regular incineration if you don't have any of such thing and if you have identified a biological waste disposal vendor who is certified by the pollution control board of the respective state you can hand over this uh, biomedical waste to them and then they can further go and incinerate the same material for you so all the disposal waste disposal should be well planned in animal facility be it liquid waste or be it solid waste whatever waste comes from animal facility should be treated as biomedical waste and please maintain all the guidelines which needs to be uh, followed in terms of zoonotic disease just few examples um, between animal species uh, non-human primates or other species especially uh, disease which primarily affect our organs uh, you should be aware of like lymphocytic chor choriomeningitis uh, rat bite fever or henta fever the rest all are already mentioned here you can go through that and as long as possible while you enter the animal facility please wash your hands and you have done any any activity inside the animal facility be it cleaning animal handling dosing blood collection handling of the animals weighing of the feed or any activity which you would have done inside the animal facility try and make sure that you do a proper washing of your hand okay nowadays with because of the covid i think now most of us are well trained in doing good hand wash uh, uh, and I, I i mean hand following a good hand wash technique and i think uh, you should keep doing that if you're working in an animal facility okay waste disposal already mentioned uh, protective parking personal protective equipments uh, so it, it's, it's a whole it has evolved as a complete science it's not at all related only to zoology or to veterinary but anybody who is interested in nutrition genetics uh, microbiologists, biotechnologists, any of these people can work in animal facility uh, because each one will have their uh, role as per their qualification, right? You can do all kind of testing, so microbial assays, primary culture, secondary culture preparation from animals if you are a biotechnologist or a microbiologist. If you're from nutrition field, you can definitely work on the diet induced models If you, and also in breeding, knockout, knocking, the biotechnology knowledge comes into the play and if you're a veterinary or a pharmacy or a or a zoology background you can definitely work in animal facility okay so uh, there are many facilities where they need uh, uh, trained persons uh, as well as uh, in academy as well as in industry so if you have if you are trained on uh, all these techniques and procedures how to work in animal facility you do have a scope with a few of the facilities the picture just a small video which i showed you from pbr private limited and many other institutes are mentioned here they all do regular trainings uh, for animal handling for animal house management for breeding and uh, technical scientific trainings on animal usage and all so you can definitely utilize uh, this opportunity to get yourself trained on any of these facilities okay so the take home message is animal usage is indispensable no matter what welfare ethics we talk about animal research is must without that drug discovery development can never happen okay you can definitely you decrease the usage of animal but you can never replace the animal research okay in drug discovery and development 
and uh, earlier it used to be a very simple research now it has grown into a complete science so uh, chemistry biotechnology microbiology pharmacy veterinary zoology everybody has a role to play even in animal science it has grown that big nowadays right and uh, always uh, try and follow you know, cpcsa guidelines of cpc of maintaining the animal facility and uh, wherever uh, possible uh, at least do due diligence to to practice good welfare and uh, what do you call welfare and ethics uh, within the usage of animals in research okay and uh, as i mentioned there is a huge scope and and a lot of opportunity in academia and industry for animal facility uh, sciences okay so that's that's about the laboratory animals uh, about the virtual tour of the animal facility okay and uh, very quickly let me just uh, in few next 10 15 minutes and then i will stop uh, we'll have a discussion if you have any career related uh, questions uh, we will we will quickly see about um, the operations inside the animal facility also, especially in terms of clinical toxicology. So as we have seen and studied this, toxicology comes from a word Greek word called toxicos means poison. Okay. So uh, toxicology, the moment you say means acute, subacute, chronic, subchronic studies, genetic toxicity studies. All the studies are uh, are defined. As per the guidelines from OECD, EPA, EMEA, JMF, Schedule Y, USFD, ICH, and WHO. So each of this uh, have their own uh, regulatory uh, guidelines. And uh, under this guideline, uh, what do you call an, an experimental animal? Any live vertebrate animal used or intended for use in research qualifies to be called as experimental animal. Laboratory animal, especially. Refer to any animal which is bred or maintained for use in animal experiments. That is called laboratory animals, right? They are born in lab and they uh, they die or they get terminated within the same facility. Those are called as laboratory animals. Why? Uh, what is an ideal animal model? So visible circulatory system, vital process that is for uh, zebrafish. But their system should be somehow similar to human. There should be a capability, uh, ability to extrapolate the data. It should be reproducible. Uh, the availability of the animal should be should be there. Uh, they should be smaller in size. We should be able to observe the entire lifetime of the animals, and they should be easy to keep, and they should be cheaper. So under this uh, uh, this uh, uh, different. Uh, what do you call requirements uh, if are fulfilled then that's an ideal animal model we already talked about laboratory animals so most common species of mouse used in drug discovery uh, preclinical development is swiss albino and bulb c even cd1 mouse rats wister and spread dolly spread dolly guinea pigs hartley rabbits as i already mentioned new zealand white and beagle dogs so these are the most common strains of the species and the species used in preclinical development for ecotoxicology, Japanese quails, fish, honeybees, daphnia, algae, they all are used for ecotoxicology. Are there any alternatives? Yes, cell based models are there. There are in silico models are there. And wherever possible, you can always use lower species. Uh, I think just try and curtail the uh, usage of larger species. And uh, you know, cell based, you have hepatocytes, enterocytes, all of them can be used as in vitro techniques even human models like uh, hepatocytes enterocytes uh, cryopreserved human intestinal mucosa everything is available from even human also so those models are all uh, also available so actually before going into live system you can definitely try all this thing. when you're talking of housing of experiment i think we already covered everything just for one point try and maintain as much environmental enrichment as possible while handling always wear protective wear, gear, protective wear uh gloves is must do not handle animals from holding their tails up right but you can easily hold them with a flap of skin on their back between the just behind between the ears uh, with your left hand and uh, with your right hand you can hold very gently their tail and when you flip around 
this is how you hold a typical uh, rat or mice in your hand now you can easily through oral uh, intubation tube you can give them the oral dose administration here is the area where you can take a flap of skin and give an intraperitoneal injection on the leg you can stretch this and give them an intramuscular injection so you see uh, animal is hold properly you can give whatever route of administration you want to give while lifting them from the cage this is the bedding material which is paper shredding as you can see but hold them with your uh, except for your fun uh, your thumb rest all the fingers should be below the animal in the uh, abdomen uh, between the two legs and you can um, have your thumb just behind the ear slightly behind you should keep otherwise they got very sharp incisors they can really turn their neck and bite you so you should keep it slightly behind and never ever do it with bare hand always try and wear gloves this is how you can really hold them in your hand before injection you can hold this like a rabbit or like a big young baby you should have your one hand below their uh, below their thighs and the other uh, leg behind their neck this is how you can hold them like a baby just like this uh, a beagle dog has been okay. so that's how the handling of the animal few things about uh, dosing uh, so it can be uh, oral route intravenous intramuscular subcutaneous intradermal or any other routes of administration uh, the dose is nothing but the route uh, these are the routes through which you give the uh, drug substance uh, to be tested either for efficacy for pk or for toxicology you have to administer the drug so these are the different routes so for each species how much dose volume by which route it is very defined in the guidelines also so please follow that even when you withdraw the samples blood samples there are well defined guidelines which you have to follow for even the blood volume to be taken if you take a gavage then mouse rat rabbit dog it's like those volume not more than 10 ml per kg body weight you should be giving okay so please try to be within this range so for parental roots uh, important as you know it can get directly into the systemic circulation so the ph dose volume sterile sterility the needle size how speedily you are giving the injection all those things comes into the play they are the important factors to be considered while deciding the parental routes so for subcutaneous for prolonged absorption if you want to give subcut injection is the best for mouse rat rabbit these are the dose volumes higher the species lesser is the dose volume you can give intramuscular better than subcutaneous but uh, not as good as intravenous Uh, okay so subcutaneous uh, is easy to administer multiple dosage you can be given at different uh, sites again for mouse rat rabbit dog these are the different dose volumes to be used here it's other way around smaller is the species smaller is the volume you can give intramuscularly larger is the species you can give more so as you can see in dog the ideal volume uh, dose volume ml per site is 250 microliters right which is just 50 microliter in mouse because the area available is less intravenous you can give it in three different ways less than 1 minute you can administer in their vein uh, that would be bolus if you administer within 5 to 10 minutes that slow intravenous or you can put a butterfly needle and uh, entire uh, bottle uh, infusion you can keep drop by drop it keeps on uh, administering the drug over a period of time for hours or days then that becomes your intravenous infusion okay intradermal again one of the uh, one of the preferred site for assessment of immune inflammatory or sensitiz sensitization responses not more than 0.05 to 0.1 that is 50 to 100 microliter only can be used and the uh, best way to determine whether it is correct or not after you administer the drug intradermal there will be one small uh, blab uh bulging which will be formed means you have given your injection accurately with time it will uh, become normal so blood sampling this is about collection of the blood sample uh, that is also totally dependent on the circulatory blood volume total blood volume in the laboratory animal so this is typically the blood volume available uh, per ml uh, ml per kg for each animal like mouse rat rabbit and dog 72 60s and 50s and 85 yeah so uh, 
always remember when you are collecting 7.5% of the total circulatory blood volume, you should give one week to animal, uh, any rodent you use for recovery, right? If you use 10%, then you should give them two weeks. If you use 15%, which is never preferred, but in case if you have to have 15% of the blood volume collection from the animal, then please give them four weeks to recover. Okay, only then they can be utilized for any other sampling or any other study. So typically 7.5% is preferred for a mouse weighing 25 gram, total blood volume of 1.8 ml, do not take more than 100 microliter. For a rat weighing 250 gram, 16 ml of total blood volume, do not withdraw either single or multiple uh, collections, not more than 1.2 ml. Same way for rabbit and dogs, it's well defined. What are the blood sampling sites? Basically, the roots, uh, so syphilis, uh, uh, marginal ear, again, it is for uh, rabbits, for syphilic and jugular, syphilic and syphilis are for rodents, jugular for dog uh, is the most common one. Okay. So, recommended site, as I was mentioning, for mouse, it is syphilis lateral tail, for rat, syphilis lateral and sublingual, just below the tongue also, you can put a a glass capillary and you can get few drops of blood rabbit ear is the best site marginal ear or the central uh, ear artery for dog it could be jugular or cephalic in terms of toxicity studies uh, we have already discussed acute toxicity study if your final treatment is only 24 hours less than 24 hours then you can do acute toxicity studies subacute toxicity studies generally 24 to 30 days of treatment Subchronic 30 to 90 days and anything about 90 days qualifies to be a chronic toxicity study. All the toxicity studies, uh, there are OECD guidelines. This is just for acute OECD 420, 423 and 425 can be followed. So the acute um, oral toxicity study is done, determine the range of exposure where lethality is expected. So we're just trying to find out a dose where there will be mortality, animal starts dying. So you know what dose uh, is your maximum tolerable dose, correct? So for that reason, acute toxicity is generally done. Repeated dose to see the adverse effect as a, res as a result of repeated administration of the drug, either for a subacute period, for a chronic period, or a subchronic period. Okay. So when you decide the dose for this, always remember you have no uh, observed adverse effect level also uh, dose level included in it, and a dose where you have mortality. So these two doses are fixed in between the dose which you select. So that way you can take three doses, right? Carcinogenicity to determine the carcinogenic potential of the test substance following the prolonged or repeated dietary exposure. So dose level, as I was mentioning, control low, mid, high, and then there should be a recovery period that once you stop administering the, the drug, do the adverse effects which are formed uh, are withdrawn along with the drug or are there any delayed toxicity even after stopping the treatment do we see any delayed toxicity effect so those are the uh, objectives you try to obtain from having the recovery groups as part of your project uh, of your protocol in general for any toxicity study these are the very common uh, observations we make like clinical signs a daily basis we want to see their clinical sign we want to check if they're alive they are active so morbidity mortality now once a week we can check their body weight if at all it is increasing or decreasing and you can correlate to toxicity eye examination ophthalmological ophthalmological examination is must before the treatment and after the just before the sacrifice of the animals food consumption can be recorded on a weekly basis is there increase in food intake or, or decrease uh, NBOFOB, uh, you can do it weekly and terminal. There are blood hematology and clinical chemistry at the terminal blood collection you can do. You can do the urine analysis. And then finally, after sacrifice, once you have the organs, you can prepare a histopathology slides. Uh, before that, you can have an organ uh, examination, the gross examination, and then you can check for histopathology also. So this is the minimum space requirement, uh, weight range, um, floor, areas number of animals so as i mentioned you should not overcrowd at the same time try and not keep animal all by himself all alone they need social behavior so keep it keep it in a social environment so if their weight is below 100 this is the number of animals you can keep in a cage if their weight is more than 500 then these are the number of animals you can keep in the same cage this is for rats same way for mouse so this can be done 
So basically, metabolism, ADME, drug-drug interaction studies, all these studies are done at different phases of drug discovery and development, and often they overlap between the phases. So it's not that you just do it once and then it's over. It, you have to keep doing these studies and they somehow overlaps from uh, your lead optimization preclinical to clinical development. Like soft spot and reactive metabolite analysis you do it by lead optimization, in vivo, in vitro correlation while preclinical development, even ADME in animals and toxicity studies, tissue distribution, all those things in preclinical and even can continue while you're doing your phase one. And then clinical DDI studies also happens during the phase two and phase three uh, studies also. So this is the role of metabolism, ADME and DDI studies in drug discovery and development. Okay. So basically, uh, these are the activities being done. Early discovery, you do refinement, chemical, biological characterization of the novel drug. You do ADME studies, you do safety, toxicity studies in animals. You do formulation development. Then finally, you go for an IND submission. Once they approve, you get into phase one clinical trial and then do you, you do phase two and phase three. Again, go to regulatory agency for registration. And once they allow you, uh, they approve the registration, go and market the drug. And even after it is marketed, you can always look for post-marketing surveillance and use that learning and then modify the, uh, the drug if possible. So discovery is all about finding new active structure, whereas development is converting that active structure into a useful drug. That is called development. Okay. So uh, again, don't want to spend much time on it. We have already discussed this in past. Uh, you have to do in vitro, uh, in vitro animal studies. You can do in vitro human studies. You can do in vitro animal studies. And all three together data can be used to predict the clinical outcome of your drug of interest. That's called in vitro in vivo correlation, right? So um, I think uh, I'll stop here. So because we have covered uh, almost everything about laboratory animals, about the toxicology, preclinical testing, and, and uh, other topics we already uh, covered. So let me just stop here in the next 15 minutes. Uh, let me spare this time doing uh, uh, clarifying any any of your doubts if you have any questions related to your career anything related to your um, academic career your research uh, or, or professional career um, from if you are from any field uh, you may ask uh, like what should you do which field you can go for I, anything and if i'm able to answer i'll answer if I don't know the answer, I'll try to get you an answer for that. So now it's open for uh, discussion. So any question to any of you participants uh, related to your career, uh, please feel free to ask. Over to you, uh, Mahishwari. Yes, 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 sir. Students, anyone having any queries, please respond in the chat box. I will pass to search. Okay, please respond. Students, anyone having any queries, please respond in the chat box. Please clarify your doubts. Okay, I'll open the chat. Sir, is there any job opportunities in India for PharmD? Yes, yes, it is definitely there uh, for PharmD. Uh, I, I think just a few years ago it has started uh, PharmD, but uh, definitely there is a job opportunities nowadays. I see many companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and uh, uh, even the contract research organizations, they are coming up with a request uh, uh, asking for PharmD candidate. So definitely PharmD is, is, is useful. I understand. Uh, PharmD students always think of uh, going outside India, uh, but uh, now uh, PharmD is even considered in India also. A lot of uh, companies who work with their clientele based in US and other countries, uh, they do prefer PharmD candidates. Students, anyone having any more doubts, please respond. Sir, in what areas for PharmD students have job opportunities? Uh, 
So for, uh, in in what come again? What is it? In what areas? For oh, in what areas? I mean, we found the uh, as per uh, uh, as per my understanding is concerned in pharmaceutical industry, especially I have seen when they are dealing with clinical trials or even while they are uh, working with uh, research purposes also i have seen requirements for farm d okay and even in manufacturing sites also they they do consider farm d nowadays that's what i'm saying that earlier it was considered that yes uh, uh, pharmacovigilance uh, was the major part where they used to consider but now it has opened up i mean everywhere i i see b farm slash d farm as their requirement so it's, it's just that uh, uh, it is now because this is relatively newer course i guess it was not there earlier uh, now farmd has come up uh, so uh, companies have also started uh, realizing that but earlier uh, farmd was not there so that's why you you never see any job uh, advertisement where they even ask for the farm uh, farmd uh, candidates but nowadays, uh, I always see in most of the pharma areas, including pharmacovigilance and all, they ask for, whenever they ask for pharmacy, they do ask for PharmD candidates also. Yes, medical coding is a requirement. Uh, is, it is definitely important. That's what I said. See, medical coding is important. And for all those companies who have their clientele based in US and Europe, medical coding is one of the important field even today medical writing or medical coding and for that also farm d is is preferred sir one more question i have put in a chat box sir is there medical coding is important for farm industry yeah yeah that's that's what i answered that see straight away medical coding is not important i mean is not relevant that much straight away with the manufacturing and all but as i'm saying slowly this awareness is coming up so right now for medical coding is 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 restricted to outside india scope also okay uh, for all those companies who have uh, operations in india but they have tie ups outside india they do prefer uh, candidates, uh, especially for medical coding. But very soon, all this thing will be applicable very much in India also. So I think it should be useful in Indian uh, perspective also. In uh, okay, in pharma industry, jobs uh, only prefer males. Why don't prefer females? Okay, uh, answer is yes and no. I'll tell you. Uh, it's not like that actually but yes uh, see if there is a manufacturing unit uh, this is mostly what i have seen in a manufacturing production unit the working hours are like that generally they are shift hours okay there are shift hours which which goes on uh, longer uh, like their day shifts their night shifts so 24 by 7 production and manufacturing is going on so if there are male candidates it's an assumption that uh, they, if they are called in a odd shifts, they should be okay with it compared to female candidates. Uh, so, so that's the only reason. But otherwise, in terms of their understanding, their knowledge, what they can contribute, I think there is no difference between a male or a female candidate. Uh, say this was only for production and manufacturing. I am saying, but when it comes to any other part like quality assurance. There is no difference male female both uh, can be working there if it is a research unit if it is a particular pharmacology department or a pharmaceutical department it doesn't matter if it's a male or female they both can do really well and and uh, they both have equal opportunities so this particular uh, preference of males and females uh, is only for production units where uh, and again, I'm saying it's just an assumption. If if any female is 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 willing to work in shift, uh, then even that uh, should be okay. But except for that, I don't think there's any any differentiation because uh, throughout my career of more than 20 years, I have seen worked with a lot of females, and um, I, I think every department you have equal opportunity for both males and females. There's no such demarcation at all. So, if you are a pharmacy graduate your qualification uh, would really help you irrespective of male or female it doesn't matter
at least this is what i feel students please thank you sir students please respond anyone having any queries please respond in the chat box or otherwise put in your chat box no doubts so uh, my surely while they are making up their mind uh, can we just discuss about uh, how do you want to do tomorrow so should i share a google form with you yes sir and then you uh, prepared a google form for exam sir okay and i'll send it across to you and then tomorrow the, uh, you will share it with them and uh, within 2 hours uh, they will uh, they will just... sir go ahead how many questions uh, shall we conduct sir i i think i and it's going to be hardly 25 questions uh, multiple choice questions that's all uh, option or uh, questions type sir option multiple yeah, choice yeah of course it will be multiple choice uh, options question or uh, maybe one word answers uh, they can give something like that so hopefully uh, it should be pretty straight for i think they will be able to complete in 15 20 minutes but you can decide what time how much time you want to give them but uh, I, i think i'll just share a google form with you post lunch session and then then you can utilize that uh, uh, for tomorrow's uh, assessment okay we will prepare 30 questions for 30 minutes sir sure i'll i'll do that i'll definitely give you 30 yeah. questions 30 minutes uh, at uh, 11:30 or 12 we will give the question paper to students we will share the link okay 30 minutes we will put your time and it will automatically close it. yeah just one second i will put this uh, into Yeah. So then tomorrow I don't want to be there uh, on the cl on the class, right? I will share this Google form with you, and then you will be doing the you will be conducting yeah. this SSO. Okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. All right then. We will give the grade wise uh, result, and we'll uh, who had attempted the exam, they will get a grade wise certificate, sir. And who okay. not attempted for the exam, they will get a participant certificate, that's all. Fantastic, great. So I I hope and wish that most of them will appear for it and. Uh, uh, i'm sure all of them should be should should come out of it with flying colors and then uh, they all should pass this assessment and uh, you all will be getting certificate at least i have that much confidence on on all the students so I would like to wish them all uh, best of luck okay i see one question sir is there any exam or interest test to get job opportunity in pharma industry okay uh, this uh, again it uh, varies from industries to industry uh, i would say in nutshell in pharma industry i don't think there are any interest exams but yes sometimes when you are fresher fresher in the sense you have, you have just completed your graduation or post graduation and you are going for a, a job opportunity in a particular company if they have that uh, and if there are so many candidates okay if there are so many candidates appearing for that one or two positions what they do is they conduct a uh multiple choice question uh, i mean just like what we are talking about tomorrow we want to do so they will do some kind of a quick uh, examination and uh, right there at the at the time of your interview and all those students who clear that will be going to the next round of uh, personal interview technical discussions and all those who could not clear they may have to go back so they do it but as i am saying not all the companies do this uh and mostly companies prefer to do this when they have many candidates applying for the same job but otherwise the normal procedure is once you apply for the job suppose you have done a masters so they will conduct an interview you will have to present your dissertation work right or if you are a phd scholar you have to present your research work or if you have done any industrial uh, project Uh, during your graduation if you are a graduate then you have to share that so uh, while doing that there will be a team of scientific team and other people sitting there who will take your interview and you get through it but there is no common entrance exam which has to be cleared in order to get a job in a industry as i said it is industry specific company specific choice okay so that's where uh, license sector skill development council also comes into the play we are just trying to Uh, come up with this system where if uh, a candidate is L triple S D C certified, then 
they should get more preference into the job so not now right now it's not required but going forward we want uh, to have a system in place at least in licenses sector where a day will come when everybody who works in a for in a licensed sector in a pharma industry uh, in any companies they all the candidates should be LSSS DC certified okay is, sir is there any job opportunities in india for a bsc chemistry yes of course there are huge opportunities for bsc chemistry i mean in a manufacturing in a manufacturing units production chemist is the job role uh, if you all guys remember one uh, one slide i have shared about the employment share in the industry so the graduates um, and below graduates they form for more than 50% of the job opportunities in any company right so in a manufacturing unit especially for a drug manufacturing unit the first job role is of production chemist and they are all bsc candidates right so you can easily get into uh, production chemist you can you can be a machine operator so within india with any manufacturing plant you can apply and i'm sure you will uh, get an opportunity to appear for an exam uh, i mean to for appear for an interview okay how do you get a job in uh, if i read it correctly it says fr and means formulation research and r and development if i'm not wrong so it's formulation research and development so again uh, in formulation you, i would say that your pharmaceutics background also comes into the play okay uh, so you should be at least masters if you are trying to come into formulation uh, r and d so analytical chemistry also works there very well if you have a degree in instrumentation like mica uh, one course is there which i have seen and if you are a pharma a pharmacy master m pharm candidate so these are the candidates who can definitely get into formulation r and d okay but uh, i think since it's r and d for formulation they don't really prefer only graduates so you need to be at least a post graduate uh, either an analytical chemist uh, that is masters in chemistry or you should be a m pharm with pharmaceutics uh, background or uh, some degree in instrumentation all those thing can all those candidates can get into fr and d yeah thank you sir students this webinar is to get a clarification for you not for job <laughs> am i right sir <laughs> yes, yes no absolutely i mean no no but yeah i i agree see point here is students are are naive you know uh, after doing college um, whatever graduation masters phd uh, or itis or 12th pass they actually their aim is to get jobs so i understand uh, so the point i'm trying to uh, open up for you is uh, yes uh, your questions are valid and uh, it's not that uh, we are offering a job to you right now but yes this is like uh, if you go for a job then i can really help you that yes this is the score if you don't know where to go for a job then that's what i'm trying to help you with right that uh, these are the scope after graduation in chemistry then can you get into industry answer is yes production uh, manufacturing these are all the areas you can get after pharmacy yes you can get into manufacturing production plus r and d Uh, project management quality assurance all these job roles are there for you after biotechnology you can get into r&d if you want uh, related to biotechnology or even for uh, drug discovery development companies they have biotechnology departments you can get in there right after microbiology as i discussed cell based assays forms major part of this so you can have, even biotechnology or microbiology you have scope to get into industry pharmaceutical research industry as well as in manufacturing because their quality assurance is there so quality assurance uh, in microbiology uh, micro qc microbiology is required so you can even get into manufacturing right in this webinar you get a job or not uh, i don't know what is this question but uh, we uh, in this webinar is to clarify your questions uh, related to the job okay when you are when you want a job we can definitely guide you through okay so as i said uh, i think you have i have shared my email ids also with you so of course not uh, if you don't have on top of your mind later on also you can reach out to me any point in time i'll i'll try to guide you through 
if you are uh, if you're trying to see career in pharmaceutical industry uh, so since i'm also representing licensed sector skill development council so from that perspective also i'll, I'll try and help you out uh, what you need to do in order to uh, prepare yourself to get a job in pharma industry okay if there are any uh, lacunae i can really help you out with that so that is the whole purpose of it okay and I, and i really would like to congratulate uh, andhra pradesh state skill development corporation because uh, they have taken a wonderful initiative to uh, to help you with uh, to gain knowledge like in this particular webinar you have learned about drug discovery and development and i can guarantee if you go through all the lectures what we have and you have taken some uh, learnings from it when you go out for a job uh, i am sure this knowledge will help you uh, it, if it is an r and d if it is a drug discovery and development area any of the areas which we have talked about this knowledge will help you if you are a student i hope by now you would have made up your mind where you want to do your research right where you want to do your industrial training if you want to go for summer training or industrial training so that was the whole purpose of this uh, webinar and then uh, to guide you through to to mold your career in field of your interest okay and it was much focused around drug discovery and development but pharma sector is big enough it it has lot of lot of uh, as you can see drug discovery development cmc it's a huge area correct so there are so many things uh, which covers uh, which are covered in this yeah thank you sir uh, sir you told you provide some ppt for the students students yeah so what i'll do is uh, i will i will uh, i will convert this uh, into pdfs and i will send it across to you and then you can share it with all of them Yes, sir. I will send mails to all the students. Sure. So you can send to all of them. I will just share it uh, with you, and then you can send it across to them. No worries. Yeah. Okay, sir. Later on, also they can always uh, refer uh, this uh, whenever they have any uh, questions or anything. They can definitely refer this. Yeah. Right? Okay, sir. When I'm uh, uh, submitting uh, certificates to you students, then I will send the PPT which sir has sent to me. i'll send to you may to your mails also absolutely and uh, hopefully uh, we will soon be starting uh, another such course uh, mahishwari yeah. but that we'll discuss later on yeah sure yeah so okay uh, that would be again uh, some other topic from the same industry uh, more on analytical bioanalytical side yes sir correct okay uh, so if no more questions then would like to wish all the participants a uh, uh, sincere thank you to all of you for staying with me for last 15 days uh, to go through all the topics in drug discovery and development in detail and i hope uh, it will help you uh, in in enhancing your knowledge about drug discovery and development field and uh, somehow in your own field it will help you to grow and uh, would like to wish you all uh, very best of luck for tomorrow's assessment and i'm sure all of you would be able to clear that uh very easily and all of you would be awarded with the certificate so once again my sincere thanks to andhra pradesh state skill development corporation uh maheshwari thank you for all your help uh, throughout this uh, training period you've done a wonderful job and uh, thank you to all the participants and uh, maybe we'll connect again sometime soon with yet another such course and uh, i'll be sharing i have already shared my email id but to my shuri also i'll share so even in your career future also uh, if i can be of any help to you guys i'll be more than happy so with that thank you have a great day to head all the best to every one of you thank you namaste thank you so much sir it is my duty for helping the students and it is my responsibility also from our organization thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you students thank you everyone students i'll send ppt and certificate and sir mail id to your all your mail ids okay today no feedback from students i'll send uh, to you i will consider the attendance for you all of you okay thank you thank you everyone the section was closed